Um, uh, it's a pleasure being here, and uh, thank you for uh, uh, this opportunity. Uh, personally, I like the, the Zeno slide on uh, leading change, a beautiful book by John Coter about transformation and change. I urge you to read it. And the penguins are you know, key part of that story. So it's a great story, and hope you all get inspired by it. Okay. Uh, so when Pari kind of reached out to me and uh, said, you know, we want to talk, you to talk about blockchain, the question was, uh, what do we kind of talk about? Do we talk about the technology per se? Because there's really not much to talk on the technology side. Uh, but we wanted to talk more about the business model impact of blockchain. Okay. Uh, especially if you really look at it uh, today, a lot of the financial services firms, especially in the capital market space, are leading this change. And typically, firms in this space are laggards. You know, they not really lead change on technologies like this. So if they are doing that, there's something out here for us all to kind of think about. Okay. So I'm just going to focus a lot more on the business model change. And then uh, there's also a master class. My, Kishore, my colleague Kishore is going to talk about it, I think, just at 11 o'clock. So do feel free to kind of attend that to get a little more in-depth understanding. Uh, so let me start. OK, so this is uh, what Broadridge is about. And um, there's a problem with the slide. The problem with this slide is now that I've used it, I have to kill all of you if I would use this slide again. <laughs> so um, this is, uh, why do we say that? Okay. I want you to spend a little, uh, I want to spend a little time on this particular slide, primarily because I really want to talk about what we call the network effect. Okay. Now we all talk of network aggregators, et cetera, et cetera, and why this is important in the blockchain kind of context. Okay. Uh, Broad is a leading provider in three spaces. We call it capital markets, asset management, wealth management. We're also in the corporate issuer space. Okay? Uh, today, we know if you're a, a corporate issuer and you want to communicate to your, your shareholders, I guess pretty much most of you would be a Broadridge client. You pretty much use Broadridge for your service. Okay? In that sense, we are a network aggregator sitting in the middle of a network, talk to over 600 odd broker dealers in the US and over 5,000 public corporations. So it gives you an idea of uh, the kind of both the data that we have and the network effect of Broadridge. Uh, similarly, uh, for fixed income uh, processing in the United States, we process over $5 trillion of equities trades through our system every day. Give you perspective, it's probably two or three times India's GDP process on our systems every day. And since if Broadridge is not there, there's no fixed income trading in the US. Okay. So again, uh, power of the network. You name the top 10 broker dealer, they are on our systems. Okay. I'll just pack that thought uh, on the back, back one for a minute. Uh, at India, we are uh, located in Hyderabad and Delhi, and hopefully next time we're here, we'll have an office in, in Bangalore. So we'll also be Namma Bengaluru kind of folks. Okay? Uh, we've been uh, in, this, uh, in this business from 99 in India. Okay? The very important slide, uh, <laughs> primarily because uh, none of you can fire me, but my company can. So <laughs> In order to protect myself, I kind of say this so that if my boss says that, you know, you did you say this, I can say I was misquoted. It really didn't really happen, okay? Um, so what is blockchain? So normally when, uh, when this question is asked, before I get to this, how many of you are, uh, you know, kind of working on blockchain or blockchain-related initiatives out here? One. We can have one-on-one -on -one and get done with this presentation, actually. <laughs> wow. Then the, the good news, I can say anything that I want and get away with it, right? So, okay. Uh, so normally, whenever we talk of uh, blockchain, uh, there are essentially, I, I guess, three schools of thought or three voices that we hear. Uh, first is, you know, it's something to do with Bitcoin, a very mysterious thing about it. Nobody knows who invented it. There's a Japanese guy, Satoshi, came up with this huge protocol in 2008. And you know, that's kind of the, you know, Bitcoin is more known than blockchain. Blockchain actually is the underlying you know, technology slash protocol which makes the whole Bitcoin thing work. Okay? A little background, uh, it started out in 2008 uh, with this uh, paper from Satoshi. And then you know, it kind of took off a little bit. There was obviously you know, some ripples here and there. Uh, the Bitcoin exchange was collapsed, et cetera, et cetera. 
but then people saw that the underlying you know concept and the technology behind it could be used in other applications and is in the last 2 3 years has gained a lot of interest and we've been at it for the last probably 2 3 years so that's one school one school is it's something that we just heard the second school is what i call as you know it's a technology waiting for a problem to be solved okay so what i mean by that the other day i was in hyderabad uh, right opposite the secretary there was a nice poster it said lions club of hyderabad there was a beggars rehabilitation program okay they had all nice things they said and they said that you know genuine beggars okay register at readifmail.com or <laughs> okay or call this number okay I was just wondering, like, you know, is this the technology? And we have the technology, now we have to go and find a problem, right, to solve this stuff, okay? I was just, I, I thought it was a little crazy. But some, for some people, blockchain is like that. There's this technology looking for a, a problem to be solved, whether right or wrong, okay? The third thing is obviously, you know, people who believe that blockchain is going to change the, the world. So I want to spend a little bit on why I think the third part is going to be true. If you really think about it from an economy perspective, uh, we had you know, the barter kind of trading systems long, long ago. And if you really look at the barter kind of trading systems, you kind of exchanged goods or services or cash or whatever, one-on-one, -on -one, fairly frictionless. There's no real middleman in the whole process, right? Over a period of time, as we you know, developed currency, as we developed checks, as we developed cards, you'll really see what really has happened is, in all kind of transactions, you have a middleman or a clearing house, right? And the clearing house, in turn, it's a bank, it's a credit card company, who oh, there's a clearing house, the central clearing house kind of emerged as a superpower, okay? And any transactions that you do today, there's a lot of inefficiencies built because it goes through this clearing house, and obviously, because of the inefficiencies, costs start to go up. I believe that blockchain has the ability to go back to the frictionless economy. Okay. If you really think of Uber as a, as a game changer, in a way Uber is an exchange. Okay. It connects the drivers with, the, with your passengers, so to speak, and it provides the trust in the whole exchange process. Okay. So imagine that if you could do without an, an exchange and do peer-to-peer, without having to go through the friction of any transaction. That's what blockchain can do to, to economy. The fancy slide we put together just to kind of show how typically a blockchain transaction could work. And the USP for blockchain is what we call a single source of truth. I did something wrong? What do I do need to do? This is what, what really happens in blockchain. Let's say Bob sends the bitcoins to Alice. Okay? The transaction is between the two. But if you see people on the network, they're all across the globe. And all of them are connected in this network. And this particular transaction is validated by what they call miners on the network. And then the single source of truth, which is the ledger, is distributed to all nodes on the network, which means there's no single person holding that ledger, it's a distributed ledger, okay? So essentially what really happens, if you really want to think of blockchain is, imagine for this moment, like two people having a conversation in this room, okay? And five minutes later, there's debate about who said what, okay? I'm sure people in the audience can say he said this and he said that, no, that's essentially what blockchain is, okay? You have two people exchanging a transaction, pretty much everybody is a witness to it. Moment they are witness to it, they have recorded it, so there's a single source of truth. More importantly, it eliminates the concept called double spending. The moment you have a digital asset and you transfer, you can't use that digital asset again because you, you've given it away. Okay? And that's recorded in the network for everybody to have. Okay? It's an extremely powerful concept. So 
So how does this achieve this? It achieves this through three key parameters. One is what we call as the network, which is dis decentralized and distributed. Then the validation mechanism is what we call as mutual consensus. Okay. Miners in the network use cryptography and advanced algorithms. That's what the blockchain algorithms are all built about to arrive at whether a transaction is valid or not. The moment a transaction is valid, everybody on the network gets a copy of the updated blockchain. Okay. And that makes it you know, extremely, I mean, there's a lot of cryptography used, and apparently even the computing power which Google has cannot kind of break that kind of algorithm at this point in time. Okay. We don't know what will happen if quantum computers get there, but at this point in time, you really can't break that transaction. So mutual consensus and cryptographically secure. So in order for a blockchain to work, you need a network, you need a process to communicate between the nodes, and you need a mutually agreeable algorithm. And let me uh, fast forward it to a little bit. Okay, there are two kinds of uh, uh, blockchain networks. One is what we call as permissionless blockchain networks, which is more public, which means that pretty much once you have a computer and a network, you can get onto the onto the network, and then you could uh, have your transactions. The issue here is uh, identity and trust are still an issue in this particular network. Uh, obviously, the algorithms are computationally intensive, and you, it's not really suited for high transaction speeds. So we come back to what, what we call as permissioned blockchains. It's more like a, a kind of a private network where participants are kind of known and trusted. And then the, comp the consensus mechanism need not be so computationally incentive intensive. It can be more kind of simpler. And it's more scalable for, for large scale needs. Uh, just want to kind of talk about maybe a couple of, uh, for example, uh, blockchain is used in countries like Honduras for property registry. As we know that you know, if you have a land sale, it happens many times in India, you could sell the same land to 10 people. Okay. But if you have a blockchain kind of network, that really doesn't really happen. Because once a transaction is there, it's on the blockchain, everybody knows about it, very difficult for you to double spend that. Okay. Music companies are looking at what they call digital rights management. So in case you send your music, okay, you know who's got the music over the blockchain. You can also today have uh, what they call a smart contracts enforced in the blockchain to allow you only if you pay for you to play the music. Okay. So it's going to that kind of uh, levels of uh, sophistication. Something of interest for us personally is what we call post-trade processing in the capital markets. Uh, if you have a single source of truth, by and large, you don't need reconciliation. Okay. Most of the inefficiencies in the market is built around reconciliation. The, our industry believes that we can save almost $20 billion annually in spend on, on reconciliation kind of effort. Uh, the industry last year alone has spent about a million dollars, a billion dollars in investments in the in the blockchain market. And I won't talk too much about uh, the forex markets because primarily most of us know about about Bitcoin. I talked about these two uh, at a high level. If you look at it from a landscape perspective, there are software providers and there are kind of platform uh, providers. Pl platform is both the network plus the the software. Um, some very important thing, Hyperledger is part of the Unix uh, Linux Foundation, uh, puts together the distributed uh, uh, ledger. Digital assets holding is pretty much in the space. R3 is a consortium of uh, 42 uh, financial services in institutions in the space. Okay. Ethereum is, a, a, is an IBM kind of a, a blockchain implementation. Uh, the good thing about it, it has, it has what they call smart contracts. Uh, so from our perspective, we believe both uh, the public and private blockchains will have a role, uh, but it will be more initially the private blockchain because that's where the industry is today. Because you look at the industry, you really can't kind of rip open everything and get everybody to network at the same time in the same place. So it will be more about private blockchains with some nodes having uh, you know, more control than the others and over a period of time transitioning to a permissionless blockchain. Uh, from a Broadridge uh, India perspective, uh, we would say that uh, the Broadridge, uh, the COE for blockchain is uh, based out in, in India and Hyderabad. Um, we are building uh, 
maybe four applications which will be blockchain ready in the next quarter or so. Uh, from an investment perspective, we have invested uh, in digital assets holding uh, as part of our blockchain strategy. We also part member of the Linux uh, Foundation Hyperledger product. We're also starting to collaborate with many uh, startups in the space. Uh, so that's pretty much what we are kind of doing. Uh, we got about 15 SMEs specialized in the space, about 25 blockchain technologies. Uh, so this is finally uh, what I really wanted to kind of end. We believe that this could be a game-changing kind of an innovation, disruption, or whatever you may call it, primarily because it's going to bring in a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, which is, you know, you, you're bringing trust to an inherently trustless kind of a network, so, which is, I think, a, a, a great kind of change that we could see. Um, from a time frame perspective, we'll start, we believe we'll start to see uh, applications come out in the next 24 months or so, and most of them will be very production ready, very stable, maybe in the, in the next five years kind of time frame. So this is the acknowledgments, and uh, thank you very much.